Hi and welcome to Biostock Studio and the first of a number of features regarding Malmö-based Psychzone. The aim of this feature is to get to know the company and its business outlook a little bit better. Today we will be focusing on the clinical development and the current status. Psychzone has two candidates, one against RA called Rebeximode, which is in phase 2b and the preclinical candidate T20K against MS. And here to tell us more is the newly appointed CEO, Carl Magnus Högerkopp. Welcome, Carl Magnus. Thank you. Like I just said here, you have recently been appointed permanent CEO. You've been an interim for a while. What does this mean, if anything, for Psychzone? In reality, we get, um, I suppose, more um, clear directions for the company. Uh, we uh, keep away from the uncertainties that an interim position um, possibly entails. Uh, but uh, in general, it doesn't uh, affect the company that much uh, uh, since I have been working in Saxon now for about a year and a half. I've been in the CEO position for about uh, six months uh, and I'm well integrated to in my role uh, and also well integrated in the projects and uh, business activities of Saxon. So business as usual in some ways then? Yes, very much so. You mentioned uncertainties here, and it's not just um, perhaps the interim CEO that leads to some sort of uncertainties, but also the stock market in, in general has been a very uncertain, maybe even horrid environment for biotech companies uh, this year. What's your general take on that? No, that's the correct. It's, it's uh, not ideal. Um, time to, to uh, drive projects for, forward uh, for a biotech company with uh, the contractions that are on the market. Uh, it uh, certainly affects our abilities to raise funds off the stock market and we see that with many, many companies uh, like us that uh, seem to struggle with uh, raising funding. Uh, for Psychzone uh, itself we come to realize that it may not be fair to our shareholders to have a, a new share issue at this moment. Uh, and for that reason, we are ramping up our activities for partnering, partnering discussions, and also trying to explore non-dilutive funding activities. Uh, the drawback with these activities, of course, is that they are, you're not in control of the outcome to that extent. But uh, we are very active when it comes to non-dilutive funding applications and also in our discussions with uh, various partners. Uh, so that's the way we see that we can build uh, future projects in Saxon. So when you're out talking to people having these discussions, do you get any sense of optimism or things about to turn for the biotech sector? Indeed, indeed. Uh, uh, I have um, uh, recently discussed with uh, some colleagues in uh, New York, for instance, and where um, there is optimism. Uh, I brought this uh, graph here just to illustrate this a little bit. It's the Standard & Poor Biotech Index XBI, which illustrates a little bit uh, where we are now in red. Of course, it, it is a contraction on the market, uh, but nevertheless, we see how the current cycle is actually mimicking very much a uh, previous cycle. So I think this brings a little bit of optimism uh, regarding biotech stocks. And I hope, of course, that this is reflected uh, also in the Swedish stock market. I think we all hope that. Mm -hmm. So you are now in the situation where you're set to initiate the phase 2b study with Rebecca mode. What's the current status in terms of getting this study started? Yeah, so the uh, trial has uh, been gone through a, a very important phases up until now. So uh, we have during the spring of 2022 prepared all the sites that are to be included in this study. So uh, in total, 45 sites across eight countries. Uh, they're all approved. And uh, of course, they're waiting to uh, get started. Um, and after that, we have uh, applied for um, clinical trials approvals in uh, Poland and Hungary and Georgia to start out with. Those are the three countries we aim to start out with. And uh, we have received um, 
approvals from Poland and Hungary, which are very important countries because that's where we believe that we can recruit over half of the patients and, and perhaps even more. So very important countries. We're still waiting for Georgia. However, uh, I should also mention that uh, we, in June, we had a pre-ID meeting with the American uh, authorities, FDA, and we received some feedback from them where they expected us to also complement one of our non-clinical studies that we have uh, run with a, a new one, and we hoped to be able to run that during the autumn. And however, uh, we see that that, uh, that study has been slightly delayed and we will therefore push things forward a little bit more in, in terms of uh, timing. We would like to see the, the readout of that study before we actually commit to start the study. So again, it will, we will need to give it another few months. I actually wanted to delve a little bit deeper into to this study. A couple of years ago, you carried out a phase 2a study with Rebexmo that did not meet the primary endpoints. What kind of implications, if any, does this have for the phase 2b study? So this was a study that was run on quite severe RA patients. Uh, it was quite remarkable in that respect because uh, these were patients that have lived with the disease for quite a long time, eight years in, uh, on average. Uh, they were quite affected by the disease. They had a really high disease activity scores. They had almost yeah, 18 to 20 tender and swollen joints, so very severe patients. And this study was had its primary endpoint readout at week 12, like many studies in rheumatoid arthritis typically have. Uh, and we didn't reach the significant difference in terms of the primary endpoint at week, eight, uh, week 12. How, however, we saw that when we continued this study that at week 16, uh, our 50 milligram dose met all of the secondary endpoints that we looked at with significance. So we are really, really confident to carry on with the 15 milligram in a next study. The next study, however, will be on patients that are not so uh, severe uh, in, in their disease as in this study. And that's also reflecting more the current type of patients that you can reach of today. So, so when you run these types of st studies, it, it is really to ask a question and you learn something from it. And in the next iteration, you bring that new knowledge into the new study. And that's ex exactly what we have done. So it's a very important study to us for the upcoming programs uh, for developing Rebex body in rheumatoid arthritis. You mentioned learning and patient groups here. So what is, where is the plan to position Rebeximode based on what you know so far? So let me shift to this slide here, which I think is very much illustrating how the disease course of a typical RA patient looks. Um, what happens is that you develop flares and with each flare you will accumulate new joints that are affected by the disease. In our previous study we were running the study on patients that are more to the right on, on this graph, whereas in the next study we will be aiming for patients that are more to the left in this graph. And that is important because that's where you have a current medical need. You have uh, almost 50% that do not benefit from the standard of care metotrexate. And what they are typically then offered is more advanced therapies like the biologics, which are injectables, either intravenous or subcutaneous injectables. And we think that there's room for other alternatives that uh, are oral, orally available and will give patients more freedom to manage the disease themselves without having to uh, escalate in the treatment regimen. So that's how we think that we can position Bexmod. If we then turn to your other candidate, T20K, could you elaborate a little bit on the new fi findings that have been presented this year? Yes, of course. Uh, so uh, I brought 
this graph to illustrate what um, we have found recently and also presented recently with respect to T20K in combination with a cap opioid receptor agonist. Uh, in our research with T20K, we found that uh, it's modulating the cap opioid receptor. And for that reason, we started to investigate what a kappa opioid receptor agonism and T20K can do together. What we found is that we have very interesting synergies from the two molecules together as illustrated here. What more is that uh, independent of this, it has been discovered that the kappa opioid receptor agonist is actually facilitating remyelination in preclinical uh, MS models. And that is very, very interesting, of course, if we can combine that function with a immune modulatory function that T20K will uh, contribute with, uh, that could potentially make a very interesting MS drug. And then just as a final question, could you just summarize for us what the strategy is for T20K going forward? Yes, uh, of course, we would like to continue to explore this combination as we see very interesting potential for it. But T20K in itself is a very interesting immunomodulator that can be also implicated in other indications. So that's what we're looking at right now to see what other ind indications could be used T20K. And I guess if I ask you what those other potential indications are, you are not going to give me an answer? No, not right now. We see, of course, we see potential for T cell modulation and uh, typically in many of these autoimmune diseases, T cells and macrophages are the central players driving the disease. So in our company, we actually have two assets that are targeting the maybe the mo most important uh, cell subsets that are driving autoimmune disease. And with that, we've had an update into Psychosome's clinical development, and we look forward to more updates from the companies coming soon. Thank you so much, Carl Magnus. Thank you.